Father, we thank you for your word and for how it always proves fruitful as we open it up. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, fill us with your spirit, and give us a, a clear picture of what you want us to hear this morning, that we may apply it to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, so if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 7. Uh, Proverbs is a book written, attributed mostly to Solomon, and the key with that is these are wise sayings for a king to his son. So we are sons of the kingdom, and because we're in the kingdom, we need to live like it. And so a lot of the advice is taught throughout all of scripture, and the other thing is perhaps uh, Solomon could have taken some of his own advice, because as we'll see, if he would have just paid attention to what he wrote. Um, sometimes we don't even follow our own advice and we forget. We forget what's really important in life. And so as we walk in the Spirit, uh, a couple of the main things, themes today will be the ways of the harlot, the ways of uh, an adulterous woman, and then also how the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We've already covered those a little bit, but there's a few other nuances today. So we're going to continue to dive in. Verse 1 of chapter 7. My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live. And my law is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart, and say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. For, the window, uh, for at the window of my house I looked through my lattice, and I saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a man devoid or without lacking understanding. Passing along the street near her corner, and he took the path of her house, or to her house, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black of the dark night. And there a woman met him, and with her attire, the attire of a harlot, and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside, at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him with an impudent face, she said to him. With a shameless face, she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows. So I come out to meet you diligently to seek your face. And I found you. I have spread my bed with tapestry colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey and he has taken a bag of money with him. And will come home on the appointed day or on the, the new moon. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. And immediately he went after her. As an ox goes to the slaughter or a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare. He did not know it would cost his life. Now therefore listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way of hell, descending to the chambers of death. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? What a delightful, but not so. Uh, in Proverbs 23, we have the picture of an alcoholic, someone who uses alcohol and, and how treacherous that is. Here we have the picture of someone looking through a lattice and seeing it's kind of a figurative way. But this person is saying, I looked out the window and I saw the way that this foolish man went and how he was persuaded and enticed by this enchanting woman. And we're going to take a look and break down a few things that we see here. Uh, this is a reoccurring theme, so I don't want to overemphasize but I do want to hit some of the highlights. Let's look at the first five verses. Proverbs chapter 7. My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law is the apple of your eye. Okay. It's one thing for us to hear the word of God. It's another thing for us to treasure the word of God. And as a father to his son, the author here is saying, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we want you to keep words. What does that mean? Keep my words. Keep my command. Um, in Revelation, Jesus says, because you were faithful 
um, and you have kept the word of my patience, Philadelphian church, so too I will keep you from the hour that is coming upon the whole face of the earth. So there's this sense of keeping, treasuring, putting it in your heart so that it is part of you and it's alive and it's active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So when you have the word of God in you and it's alive, you treasure it. Um, we're going to see later more than rubies or diamonds or silver or gold. It is, it is much more, more important than anything else in life. Amen? The word of God, the word, the teachings of our God, they're more important than anything. Amen? Because without that, we wouldn't even have hope. And so treasure those commands within you. If you keep those commands, you will live. You ever told your kid, hey, when I say stop, stop. And they're like, whoa, I didn't hear you. Well, if there were a Mack truck coming down the street, if I say stop, you stop. It may save your, save your life. It's the same kind of saying. With my kids, I find myself saying that a lot with Enoch. We had an incident yesterday. Was it, it was, uh, was it Friday night. He he is injury prone, and the, he got hit in the head with a piece of wood that fell off the fence, four by four. Anyway, it was a big big goose egg. We put ice on it right away. But the point is, you know, they want to ask why. Why do I need to listen? Right? Kids are like, why? The answer is, it's not why. It's like how fast, how high. And I say jump, you say how high. <laughs> that kind of thing is fair. I am trying to protect you. God put me in your life to protect you. And so being with that being said, with that being the reality, that's probably the thing that gets me the most angry is when, when one of them hurts another because I want to protect and anger is a secondary emotion. But it's like I get angry because I'm scared because I want to protect these kids. We're, we're in charge of them, right? You've got all these little girls or little boys that you're taking care of. And... We only have them for a short period of time. So most importantly, we want to protect them spiritually. That's what the, the proverb is pointing to here. The author is saying, here, I'm giving you some commands. I'm giving you guidelines. I'm giving you teachings. Now you need to treasure them and keep them. Oh, I really love the Word of God. Okay. I really love studying the Bible. Okay. So uh, how do you spend your time? How do you spend your finances? Oh, well, you know, just I'm in... You know, do whatever I want to do. It's like, no. How do you apply what you're studying and what you treasure in the Word of God? And as we'll see here with the whole second half of the chapter, God is trying to protect men and women alike, but he's trying to protect young men from this terrible thing called lust, from this terrible thing called adultery, from this terrible thing called uh, sexual immorality. And the whole New Testament teaches that that is the will of God, that we flee Sexual immorality. Uh, verse 2 of uh, Proverbs 7. And my law as the apple of your eye. You've got to keep it as that pupil of your eye. The very uh, center of your vision. Keep the word of God in front of you and in your heart. Bind them to your, on your fingers and write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister and call understanding your nearest kin. And they will keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. So once again, if you write them on the tablet of your heart, um, God takes our hearts of stone and he makes them a heart of flesh. And if you read in Ezekiel, I believe it is, 36 through 39, there's some pretty awesome prophetic things about that I believe haven't happened yet. But in chapter 36, it talks about the dry bones um, and how the bones come together and Israel is basically raised from the ashes and it talks about the blessing on the nation of Israel in the last days, how they will blossom, and they are, and they have. And there's a, not a mass exodus, but a mass uh, returning of the people to the land. Well, in that context, he says that he will bring a spiritual revival, and he will give them a heart of flesh. So, too, with us being Gentile believers, maybe you're a Jewish believer who's come to faith in Jesus Christ, you're Messianic Jew. Whatever the case may be, he takes our heart of stone, our, our dead heart, like we talked about on Wednesday night. We were dead in our trespasses, but Christ made us alive. Again, it is by grace that we are saved. He takes us from death to life. He takes us from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. But we want God's law written on our hearts. There's a scripture where it says uh, someone will no longer say, hey, brother, you need to know the Lord because it will be written on the hearts of men. And that's a last day's prophecy, but we're, we're in that period of time. I don't need to tell someone. I don't need to be someone's Holy Spirit. If they're a believer, 
but I can correct and encourage them. But if you have the Word of God in your heart and the Holy Spirit's living in you, He has a gracious way of bringing the Scriptures to our hearts that we need to know when we need to know them. Amen? Could you guys say that is true? Okay. And by the way, the fact that you know that's true, in Ephesians 2 it says we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and that's a guarantee for us. So that's a great assurance that we have, knowing that we're not alone in, in having God's Word come up in our, our minds from time to time. The Holy Spirit reminds us of things we need to be reminded of. Jesus says, leads us into all truth. So right here, write them on the tablet of your heart. Verse 4, say to wisdom, you're my sister. When you're young, maybe brothers and sisters don't get along very well, but sisters can be such a blessing, and especially sisters in the Lord. I think about Jenny and Jesse here at Glenville. They pour themselves out, taking care of kids, reaching out, ministering, um, you know, if I looked at wisdom as I do my sisters in Christ or my sisters, um, you know, husband and wife, my wife and I are brother, sister in the Lord, but more than that. But with that being said, you want to have this affection toward the wisdom of God. There's a proverb that says if you, uh, you beat a, a man, a fool, beat a fool a thousand times, he won't listen. But uh, one blow to a righteous man, he'll, he'll understand it and he'll take it to heart. So we want to see wisdom as our family, it's something we keep close to us. We could look at it that way. And if you're walking in wisdom, you're going to be kept from an immoral woman. You're going to be kept from those things that are dangerous to not only your soul, but your body and your mind and everything else. So what did we learn in those first five verses? The observation there, it is important to treasure the Word of God. The interpretation kind of saying, you know, if we do it, it will protect us. If we do it like the center focus, like the apple of our eye, and if we treat it like family, like it's really, really dear to us, then the application is, I need to be applying that in my life. I need to be putting wisdom, making sure I'm making wise decisions, whether it's financially, relationally, whatever the case may be. And last of all, it'll keep me pure, um, mentally, emotionally, sexually, all that pure purity. Okay. Verse 6, for at the window of my house, I look through the lattice. Um, so it kind of indicates this, never really thought about it before, but it kind of indicates that the, the man that he's going to be observing, the young man that gets dissuaded or gets deceived, can't really see that other people are watching. But other people are always watching when we sin. I mean, maybe, maybe you do a sin in secret, but this type of sin, going into immorality, there are people that are hurt by it. There are people that um, are perplexed by it. There are people that look up to you, and if you fall into immorality, they're going to be discouraged by it. So it's a very powerful thing. He's saying, I'm looking through a lattice, kind of casually looking out my window, and what do I see? I saw among the simple, the simple is not a uh, compliment in this verse, uh, but I perceived among the youths, or the sons, one who is lacking or devoid of understanding. So he goes on to say what this is. Passing along the street near her corner. At times she was outside and at times in the open square, lurking at every corner, so she caught him. I'm going to stop there. Judah book of Genesis had some sons. I don't know what it was with Tamar, if she was back cook, or if it was just very unfortunate circumstance, but her first husband died. Then her second husband died. And then on and on. The next son that was in order, Judah did not give his son to Tamar for marriage. He should have, but he didn't. I think it was in Shechem. out several months later he just had an affair basically with this unknown woman who is dressed like a prostitute he goes home and a few months later they say hey your daughter-in-law Tamar is pregnant and he goes she must be put to death like she is so wicked right and then so they bring her out and she says look the owner of the staff and the signet ring this is the one I'm pregnant by and Judah says he, well, here's the thing. He went back there looking for her, couldn't find her, because he was gonna, he was going to get his ring back and his staff back, and he was gonna. And he goes around town. And he's like, "Where's the temple prostitute? Where's this harlot? Where's this woman that I was with?" 
And everybody's like, there's no temple prostitute. There's no harlot around here. And so he looked doubly like ridiculous, right? He looked like a fool. And then a couple months later, she's pregnant. And she says, this belongs to the man who impregnated me. And he says this, she is more righteous than I. For I withheld my son that she was due to her. And she's more righteous than I. He was more guilty than her. Does that make sense? So that was a story of how someone dressed up. And this everybody in Solomon's time would have known that story. They memorized the Torah, most Jewish boys. They had heard that story dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Well, on a further note, prostitutes and harlots, I guess, were a thing even in the time of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, the sons of Jacob, okay? Um, but if you look at that, this, this woman, this prostitution, this harlotry is a flying in the family. She has a crafty heart. We'll see in Proverbs 31 that beauty is fleeting and charm is very deceptive. Charm is deceptive. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Let her, her works praise her in the gate. But we know she's dressed like a harlot. Crafty heart. She's kind of tricky. And she was loud and rebellious. So some, this, whoever the woman might be, won't listen. And her feet would not stay at home. She's just not faithful. And uh, we've seen this happen in our American culture millions of times over. At times, and it's the men too, she was outside at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. Modern day. Now this was written in a culture where they didn't have internet. And they didn't have television. And they didn't have the billboards and they didn't have all of that radio and everything. Now it's like this on steroids for young people. I think I heard the other day that the, the first uh, look of a young person, a young man, at uh, inappropriate naked pictures is at age 11. So we have such access to it. It's terrible. It's terrible. But, and it's a cancer. I think there's more profit from that industry than all of the professional sports combined. So you look at that, that is a cancer in our society on every corner, in the open square, and what gets glorified in our culture oftentimes are people whose lives are spiritually a wreck, but they look good on the outside. So she's on every corner, and what did she do, verse 13? She caught him and kissed him. So it's almost like she took the first move. She grabbed him. And we talked last time about Potiphar's wife, how she grabbed Joseph, and he ran away. So this guy could have run away by then, right? Or at that time. And with a, a shameless face, impudent face, she said to him, and this is where it gets really weird. She starts getting religious, and she starts talking spiritual, okay? But she's nothing but uh, profane. She does not care about the Lord, just so you know. You'll see. Again, I have peace offerings with me. Real religious talk. Today I paid my vows, so I come out to meet you diligently to seek your face, and I found you. This is a woman who should be at home because her husband's gone. I've spread my bed of tapestry and colored coverings of Egyptian linen. Doesn't matter how nice your bed looks. I'm not going with you, okay? I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. I don't care how good you smell, right? They say, a good-looking woman without discretion is like a pig with a, a nose ring, a golden nose ring. That's what it says in Proverbs. We'll see. She has no discretion. She may be good-looking, but and she may smell good. In the words of Shania Twain, a great theologian, that doesn't impress me much. Okay? I perform, perfume my bed. Then she goes, come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. So now she's getting to this passion, trying to appeal to his, his feelings. For my husband is not home. Not at home. Wait, what? Your husband? He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him, and he will come home on the appointed day or at the full moon. So with her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately he went in after her as an ox goes to the slaughter, a fool to the crush of the stock. So we look at that. He's like an animal. She's leading him to be butchered. That is what the sexually immoral woman does to this man here. Seducing him. Verse 22. Uh, 
the fool to the question of the stocks. No one wants to be known as a fool that gets caught up in sexual sin. I mean, it's embarrassing. But the stocks, you guys know what the stocks are, right? You stick your arms through and your head through and people come by and slap you and throw their food on you and you're just stuck there. This is in that time, in Solomon's time even, not just medieval times, they put people in stocks to embarrass them and to punish them and to basically humiliate them. Well, that's what this guy was like. He's saying, this is humiliating. If this was my son, I would be humiliated for him is what the Proverbs author is saying here. Till an arrow has struck his liver, as a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost him his life. So not only is he embarrassed, not only is he about to get um, chopped up, so to speak. Uh, you ever been hit by an arrow? <laughs> it probably doesn't feel very good. But hitting your liver, I mean, of all things. Um, and a bird hastens to a snare. Being caught in a trap. This is such a, uh, a terrible trap that when people get stuck in it, um, it can really not just ruin their life, but it's hard to get. It's despair. It's like you feel like a dead man. Did not know it would cost him his life. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth and do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way of hell, descending to the chambers of death. I want you guys to turn with me to Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. So it's just a few books back. The last, last chapter, Nehemiah. And for Esther and then Job. Chapter 12, I think it's verse 38, or 13, 28, sorry. 13, right here, 13, uh, 25, and 26. Nehemiah 13, 25, 26. This is when Nehemiah is talking and he realizes so many people have married pagan wives. So it's kind of like the context that we're saying. They married women who were spiritually uh, not faithful to the Lord and it really damaged the people of Israel. Verse 35, this is Nehemiah speaking by the Holy Spirit. So I contended with them and cursed them, struck some of them. Wow. Nehemiah, the governor, is hitting some of these guys, like slapping them. I pulled out their hair or, and I pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for, for your sons or yourselves. Did not Solomon, the king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all of Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. And then he goes on, should we, be, or should we then hear of your doing all this great evil, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women? And uh, looking at that, then he turns to prayer to God and saying, look, I've tried to do everything I can, but this is stubborn people. Nehemiah is like, this is, I can't even believe that we would marry pagan women. Okay, so let's, let's go to the Christian world right now. You trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can trust him with your eternity. You can trust him with your life. You can trust him to give you a wife or a husband. Amen? We can trust him with eternity. We can trust him for a godly husband or wife. And if your, God, if your husband or wife is not that godly, he can make them more godly. He can change their hearts. He can make them his own child. Verse 26, For she cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to Sheol or hell, descending to the chambers of death. Okay, we're going to see that recurring, but that's pretty strong language. We need not go down that path. Men, young men especially, seems to be a cancer. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 8, Proverbs. Does not wisdom cry out and understanding lift up her voice? So we have a female pers personification of wisdom. She takes her stand on the top of the high hill beside the way where the paths meet. She cries out by the gates at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the doors. To you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O you simple ones, understand prudence, and you fools, be of an understanding heart. 
Listen, for I will speak excellent things, and from the opening of my lips will come right things. For my mouth will speak truth, wickedness is abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are with righteousness, and nothing crooked or perverse is in them. They are all plain to him who understands, and right to those who find knowledge. Receive my instruction, and not silver, receive, or, and acknowledge rather and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one desires cannot, one may desire, cannot be compared with her. Read 10 and 11 again. Receive my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one may desire cannot be compared with her. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. Counsel is mine, and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign, and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule, and nobles, all the judges of the earth. You might circle this one. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Riches and honor are with me. Enduring riches and righteousness, for my fruit is better than gold, yes, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I traverse or travel, walk about the way of the righteous, in the midst of the paths of justice, that I may cause those who love me to inherit wealth, that I may fill their treasuries. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way by, uh, before his works of old. I have been established from everlasting. From the beginning before the, there was ever an earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled. Before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world. When, I, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, when I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and my delight was with the sons of men. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not scorn or disdain it. Blessed is a man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul and those who hate me love death. We have a huge discourse here from the woman called Wisdom. And the key... Verse, I would say, is verse 17, if you want to circle that. And something to ponder here, think about, is that in Corinthians, Paul says that God has made Christ to be wisdom itself. And here we also hear about the creation and how, at verse 22, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The word is Elohim, which is a plural form of the word God. El being singular. Um, But Elohim, the Holy Spirit, the Father, and Jesus were all intrinsically involved, very much in agreement, and very much responsible for the creation altogether. Colossians 1, we see that all things were made in Him, through Him, for Him. Hebrews 1 says that uh, in him uh, that he holds everything together by the word of his power. And so uh, 1 John chapter 1 mentions how God in the beginning was the word and the word was God. Sorry, that's John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. And it says nothing that was created was not made by him. Um, So looking at that, Jesus personifies wisdom this, this female personification. And he who chooses Jesus, he who chooses wisdom, he who bows his knee and says, I will do the most wise thing right now and put my allegiance, my trust into Jesus and, and put my focus on him, will find life. 
Uh, verse 17, the reason why I said circle that. I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently will find me. You look at the whole New Testament. It says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. In Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says, Ask and it will be given to you. And seek and you will find. And knock and the door will be opened unto you. For those who ask, receive. Those who seek, find. And those who knock, the door is open. So we have to have this sense of diligence um, toward wisdom. Because what is the antithesis of wisdom? What's the opposite of wisdom? Foolishness, right? What's the opposite of being saved? Being condemned, being lost. What's the opposite of being alive forever? Being dead and, and lost forever. So, so wisdom, there's a lot at stake. If we're king's kid, kids, there's a lot at stake. Um, so wisdom cries out, cries out at the city gates. She's crying out to everybody to understand. Um, nothing wicked came out of the, out of the mouth of Christ. You see there in verse uh, 7, For my mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Jesus never told a lie. Now, in stark contrast to other religions where you can tell a lie or where um, Allah could be a liar, our God does not lie. It is impossible for him to lie. And he said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Jesus never lied. For my mouth will speak truth. There's nothing crooked. That's the other thing. I love about Jesus and I love about the word of God. There's nothing crooked. If you don't understand, you probably just need to read 40 verses before, 40 verses after, or read the whole book itself so you can understand it better. But usually people, anyone who says that the Bible is crooked, they haven't, they're ignorant. They haven't read it. They haven't had the Holy Spirit come into their life. And we talked about that last time. I think be filled with the Holy Spirit. That helps you actually understand what the scriptures say. Because the Holy Spirit authored it. So you're going to be prudent if you're wise. If you're a child of God, you'll be wise. You'll have prudence. You'll have understanding. You'll have knowledge. All these things go together. You're going to have justice because you won't want to oppress people who shouldn't be oppressed. Verse 15 and 16. You have kings and princes and judges of the earth. If you're a child of God, uh, Paul said, you know, where is the philosopher? Where is the disputer? Where is the um, wise man? God has purposely made their wisdom to be foolishness and their strength to be weakness by the foolishness of the preaching of the cross and taken those things which were nothing and shamed those things which are, taken those things which are weak and shamed those which were strong, taken us, not many of us were mighty, not many of us were noble, not many of us were good looking, powerful and all these different things, but yet God has used the simple preaching of the cross which is foolishness to them that are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the very power of God. That is what God uses. That is the most wise thing. And that fruit is better than gold, better than choice silver, verse 19. Better than rubies. Better than anything we could ever treasure. Verse 22, all the way, uh, oh, I love this. It says, <laughs> I don't even have enough time to adequately cover this. I'm so sorry. This is terrible. Verse 27, the circle of the deep. This proves this Solomon, by the Holy Spirit, they knew that there was a sphere, a circle. Isaiah says that he sits above the circle of the earth, and Job talks about it. And we didn't know that the earth wasn't flat until 1492. I mean, you look at it, the Bible has so many little nuggets. I'm just scratching the surface with you all so you can do your own studies. But, blessed is the man who listens to me, verse 34, watches daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors, for whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Now there's an awesome uh, thing that says he who finds a wife finds favor and receives, or finds a good thing and receives favor from the Lord. But even more so, we find Jesus Christ. You can be single, you can be a eunuch, you could be married, you could be divorced, you could be on your deathbed, on the cross like the thief. You find favor if you find wisdom, which is Jesus Christ. You find him, you find life, you obtain favor from the Lord. But he who sins against him, or sins against me, sins against wisdom, hurts his own soul, wrongs his own soul. And all those who hate me love that. All those who hate Jesus. You just, you, there's, he's, I am the bread of life. I am the uh, water of life. I am the good shepherd. I am he is everything you need. He is life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says in the Gospel of John. 
So if you hate life, you love death. You can't be in between. You can't be neutral. All right, we're going to read chapter 9, and we'll hit the highlights next time. But verse 10 of chapter 9 is the key verse, if you want to underline it and circle it. And this is the opposite of what a foolish woman does. She'll tear down her house, tear down her loved ones. This is the antithesis, wisdom. Verse 1, chapter 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn or cut out her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has sent out her maidens. She cries out from the highest places of the city. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding. Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Verse 10, the key of this chapter. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One, Jesus, is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years of your life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knows nothing. She's boisterous. For she sits in the door of her house on a seat by the highest place of the city to call to those who pass by, whoever, uh, for those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, stolen water is sweet. And bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. Just like the end of chapter 8. So we see here, or sorry, chapter 7, the last verse. We see here, the fear of the Lord is where it all begins. The Holy One, you need to know the Holy One. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, just give your life to Him. Ask Him to come into your life and say, I need you, Jesus. I trust you, Jesus, with my life, with my, my eternity, and I need you to be my Lord. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wisdom in Proverbs. We thank you that you protect us as we walk in your word, as we treasure your teachings, as we treasure the, the most important part of the Bible, which is your son, Jesus, who we celebrate this week and next week who came and his own did not receive him, who came perfectly and died, lived a perfect life, died on the cross and rose from the grave for our sins so that we may be set free. If there's someone here this morning, Lord, who needs to receive you, I pray that this would be the time. Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you lived a perfect life and that you rose from the grave on the third day Forgive me of my sins. Be my Savior and be my Lord. Come into my life. Fill me with your spirit. Give me the power and the strength to live for you. Lord, we just pray, if someone prayed that this morning, or if they pray that prayer, that they would, uh, they would get to know you better, that they would read your word, that they would reach out to someone, reach out to us, Lord, and ask, what do I do now? And Lord, that you would lead them to your ways in that wise path, which is Jesus and talking and walking with him. Lord, we thank you and we give you glory and pray that you would move in power in our lives. Fill us with your spirit. Guard us in your wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, have a good morning.